Clear skies overnight tonight with lows in the upper 40s expected. Sunnier tomorrow with highs around 80 degrees. This is NCPR. This is Northern Light for Monday, July 1st. Happy Canada Day. I'm Monica Sandreski. The Adirondack Land Trust got a $3 million grant to build three miles of accessible trails at two iconic spots in Lake Placid and Saranac Lake. We've discovered that there's really very little truly accessible trail network in the park and really feel that this is one way of connecting communities to a special place. Also on the show, since 2022, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has been hosting entrepreneurship fairs at military bases to encourage troops to start businesses. They have unique skills that you get from moving from base to base to moving from job to job. Uh, You've got to learn subject matter quickly. Uh, You've got to be innovative. And a new art installation in Tupper Lake uses old clothes collected from North Country farmers to highlight their labor in producing our food. I drove hundreds of miles from Essex to St. Lawrence County through Hamilton County. I said, can I have your dirty clothes? And they said, why? And I explained it and they said, this is awesome. So lots of miles to collect, but I had a great, great help from a lot of people. All that's coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Support for Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio comes from Siegel Festival in Scroon Lake, presenting live performances of Lerner and Lowe's musical Brigadoon, July 3rd through the 6th. Details and tickets at SiegelFestival.org. And by Apothecary Chocolates, making gourmet chocolates by hand from all natural herbs, botanicals, and tree syrups. ApothecaryChocolates.com. is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. Family members of a 13-year-old Karen refugee who was shot and killed by police in Utica are demanding police accountability. According to police, they stopped Naya Mwe and another teenage boy Friday night because they fit descriptions of suspects in an armed robbery that had happened there the day before. Body camera footage shows police telling the two they need to pat them down. Then Mwe ran away and pointed what officers say they believed was a handgun at them. One officer tackled Mwe to the ground and another opened fire. The officers are on paid administrative leave while the state attorney general and Utica Police Department investigate the shooting. Family members say they want the officers, quote, in prison forever. A fire Saturday night destroyed the popular amphitheater bandstand in Lake George just hours before its first concert of the summer. Village Mayor Ray Perry told the Glens Falls Post-Star newspaper that the bandstand in Shepherd Park is a total loss and had to be raised to the ground. He called it, quote, the center of our village. He said the village would try to salvage the season by perhaps renting a mobile stage as a replacement. Perry said an investigation into the cause of the fire is ongoing, adding that he hoped it was not arson. An herbicide was used over the weekend on Lake George after a years-long legal battle. The herbicide, known as Priscilacor, targets the invasive species known as Eurasian water milfoil. The APA approved the use of the herbicide, though the Lake George Association has been fighting that decision in court since 2022. Last Friday, a Warren County court judge... Uh, excuse me, a Warren County judge denied the LGA's final appeal, ultimately allowing Priscilacor to be used on Lake George. According to the Glens Falls Post-Star, the herbicide was applied over the weekend on two bays in the lake. It was also used on Chattagay Lake and Lion Mountain last Friday. The APA was has previously approved the use of the herbicide on Minerva Lake, Brant Lake, and Lake Luzerne. So far, the chemical herbicide has successfully eradicated milfoil without apparent side effects to wildlife habitats or humans. 
The Adirondack Land Trust got a big financial boost last week. The group was awarded a $3 million grant to build about three miles of accessible trails in the Tri Lakes. Those trails will be built so that people in wheelchairs or with strollers or other accessibility issues can enjoy some of the most iconic Adirondack views. Emily Russell has the details. The news of the $3 million grant came last Thursday. That's when I interviewed Mike Carr at his office in Keene. Carr is the executive director of the Adirondack Land Trust. So it was an exciting day. We learned today that we have been awarded a grant through the Northern Border Regional Commission of $3 million to invest in two of our properties that we'd like to build accessible trails on. Those two properties are the Glenview Preserve, just north of Saranac Lake, and 187 acres along the Lodge Road in Lake Placid. By developing a network of accessible trails at both properties, Carr says the land trust is aiming to fill a void in the park. We've discovered that there's really very little truly accessible trail network in the park. You know, hundreds of miles of other trails, um, but very few um, opportunities for people that are have challenges with mobility and really feel that this is one way of connecting communities to a special place. The plan, says Carr, is to split the $3 million grant up. $2 million would go towards building about two and a quarter miles of accessible trails at Glenview. And then a million dollars would go towards building about one and a quarter mile of accessible trails along the Lodge Road. This will allow people with strollers or wheeled walkers or wheelchairs to safely be outside and really enjoy two special places. Both of them have big views. You know, Glenview, the backside of Whiteface, and uh, the Lodge Road is really the high peaks and Indian Pass, and they're both kind of dramatic. Although building a total of three miles of trails may not sound like a lot, Carr says making sure those trails are accessible to everybody is complicated and expensive. So the site is critical, right? It has to be really level. The grades are prescribed at, you know, 2%. And most of the Adirondacks are a lot steeper than 2%. So specific grades and drainage is quite important so that they're dry and not soft. The Adirondack Land Trust still needs to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to match part of the grant from the Northern Border Regional Commission. The commission is also providing grants to 26 other agencies from northern New York up to Maine. The $3 million that the Adirondack Land Trust is receiving was the largest grant given by the commission. Emily Russell, North Country Public Radio, Keene. A federal agency is trying to help military troops and veterans become entrepreneurs. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is holding events at bases around the country to help people with military experience develop new products and start new businesses. Andrew Dyer of the American Homefront Project introduces us to a pair of veterans who hope to make money by involving a common annoyance of military life. At the San Diego Central Library, a laser cutter carves a pre-programmed shape out of a scrap piece of wood. This is the device a pair of sailors credit for making their idea real. Matt Semple and Andy Camp were surface warfare officers on the USS Jason Dunham, a guided missile destroyer. Semple says it was difficult sharing a stateroom with their different watch schedules. I remember I'd be asleep, I'd wake up to Andy literally banging uh, on the sink to try to get his, his razor clean. Sailors are required to shave every day. It's something Camp says they're indoctrinated with from the first days of training, and it's something they think a lot about. He started thinking about just how annoying that was. Because everything about shaving is worse on a ship, right? The bathroom's tinier, the water pressure's worse, uh, the lighting's worse, whatever. The pair had an idea. What if razor cartridges could be cleaned without the mess and racket of banging on a sink? Camp began sketching designs, and what emerged was an early version of the razor rinser. It's a small plastic device that pushes water through disposable razor cartridges, keeping the blades fresh and hair out of sinks. I think by the time we left that deployment, we had the general shape of it, which is basically just a pump that sprays water through your razor blade and then recycles it through filters. Even while Semple and Camp were still deployed in the Mediterranean, they began to think their idea could have commercial potential. 
Kathy Vidal is the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. She says entrepreneurship isn't unusual in the military community. They have unique skills that you get from moving from base to base to moving from job to job. Uh, You've got to learn subject matter quickly. Uh, You've got to be innovative. In 2022, the Patent Office began hosting entrepreneurship fairs at military installations across the country. Vidal says the idea is to bring local resources together to help get service members, military spouses, and veteran inventors on the right path. We can talk about the entire journey. How do you know when you're ripe to be an entrepreneur, when you're willing to take that risk? How do you get the funding? What are different ways of doing that? What are the support structure around you? Camp attended one of the Patent Office roadshows at Naval Base San Diego and was ready to take the next step to develop a prototype. The pair needed a makerspace, and Camp says they found one where they didn't expect. I was shocked to see that the predominant one in San Diego is at the Central Library and it's also free. That's the Idea Lab at the San Diego Central Library. We have a die cut machine, uh, we have sewing machines, embroidery machines. Librarian Catherine Hong says the lab has equipment anyone might need to bring an idea to life. Sergers, uh, dye sublimation, we have a small CNC machine. The staff can show anyone how to use them and help budding entrepreneurs with other aspects of developing their products. After a lot of trial and error, Camp demonstrates their invention. When you push down, the water gets accelerated through the slots and through your razor blade. This shape, because of the gasket around the outside, forces water between the blades so it actually flushes the hair and gunk out. Both sailors have just separated from the Navy. The pair hoped to raise $10,000 in startup funds on Kickstarter. But when their campaign ended in May, they'd raised almost $70,000 from more than 1,300 backers. Some are service members dealing with low water pressure aboard ships, but others just want to save water at home or avoid the mess of shaving. Kemp says they're ramping up for their first production run and plan to sell the razor rinser for $30. In San Diego, I'm Andrew Dyer. This story was produced by the American Homefront Project, a public media collaboration that reports on American military life and veterans. This is NCPR. You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's about 10 after 8. Good morning, I'm Monica Sandresky. Coming up on the show, farmers from throughout the North Country sent in their clothes, their work clothes, to be part of an art installation in Tupper Lake. Clothesline is open now at the Wild Center, and we've got a preview in just a few minutes right here on Northern Light which is supported by the Village Mercantile Saranac Lake, partnering with local nonprofit organizations to sell their merchandise through their e-commerce store. More at villagemerc.com. And by the Adirondack Experience, the museum on Blue Mountain Lake, presenting nature hikes with Ed Cans every Thursday, July 11th to September 26th. Details at the adkx.org. And support for NCPR also is provided by today's day sponsor, Stauffer Farms, reminding everyone that July is ice cream month. Music now by Billy McKinnis out of Brockville, Ontario. The Department of Environmental Conservation certified several North Country towns as climate smart communities last week, including the village of Potsdam, the town of Potsdam and the town of Colton. The Climate Smart program gives points to local governments around the state for actions that lower greenhouse gas emissions or improve climate resilience. Communities can either be certified at a bronze or silver silver level of climate leadership. In this certification round, 23 municipalities were recognized. The city of Canandaigua in the Finger Lakes region was the only one awarded silver status. 
A new electric vehicle charging station just opened in the Adirondacks. The New York Power Authority recently installed a four-charger station in North Hudson as part of a goal to expand New York's vehicle fast charging network. According to a press release, the station is located at the Frontier Town Gateway right along the Northway, so it's accessible for people driving through the Adirondacks. While this station is now the largest between Albany and Canada, there are also electric vehicle charging hubs in Keene and in Scroon Lake. Motor vehicle deaths in New York went up about 26 percent between 2019 and 2022. During that period, the North Country had the highest fatality rate of any region in the state, about 13 fatal wrecks for every 100,000 people. According to a recent report by State Controller Tom DiNapoli's office, the national average also rose by about 17 percent. There were nearly 1,200 fatal accidents in New York in 2022, a high since 2013. This increase increase coincides with a decrease in the total number of traffic accidents in the state, as well as the number of vehicle miles traveled. New York State Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty was in Lake Placid last week. Hasty joined North Country Assemblyman Billy Jones on a tour of some Olympic venues in the village that have received million-dollar upgrades in recent years. WAMC's Pat Bradley reports. The state has invested over $500 million over the past seven years to upgrade the Olympic venues, including the bobsled and luge tracks, ski jumps, and speed skating rink. Olympic Center General Manager Chad Cassidy started the Democratic Speaker's Tour at Miracle Plaza, which also hosts the refurbished Olympic Center Museum. It's great to have you here. Appreciate you taking the time to come today. This is Miracle Plaza here. This was uh, built starting back in 2019. We just completed it a couple of years ago. Thanks to the funds from the state to come in here and kind of rejuvenate all of our venues. Got the scoreboard from the Miracle on Ice game in 1980. After taking a few selfies in front of the Miracle on Ice scoreboard, Cassidy then led Hasty upstairs, where the speaker took a virtual ride down the bobsled track. Buckle up, you're going to be going pretty fast here in a second. There will be at two people in this flight. You'd have a brake man in the back and a driver up front. There's two personal four per. And how fast would I be going? Uh, around probably... 65, 75 miles an hour, somewhere there. There you go, take the brakes. It's a good run. Hasty then jumped off the ski jump virtually. You're going to put your feet right up here, hold on on both sides, and look right through there. You're going to see what it's like to go off the jump. Now, this is just the practice, right? That's the actual hill, yeah. But it would have snow on it, right? Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to all the time, but it did. So I've done two we things. Can try for you to give it a try for real. A few steps away, Hasty was enthralled watching the video of the 1980 Miracle on Ice game. The greatest moments in sports. Yeah, got them right here. Where's the hockey right? Right? We're Beside gonna, us. Yeah, we're we're going to go, go in. in. Assemblyman D. Billy Jones of the 115th District led Hasty into the Herb Brooks Arena, named after the famed coach who led the Miracle Team and the site of the iconic game, and viewed the outdoor Olympic skating rink before touring the Mount Van Hovenberg sliding venues. Hasty says the tour brought back memories. Coming here now, it's like it's a little surreal. You get that... You know, proud nostalgia builds up in you. We were just inside the hockey rink, watched the uh, the video of the Miracle on Ice. The great assemblyman, Billy Jones, just wanted me to come and see uh, what the state's uh, investment uh, over the years to refurbish this uh, classic place. From what I understand, it could allow for uh, the Olympics to return. So I think it was well worth the investment. It looks beautiful. Olympic Regional Development Authority President and CEO Ashley Walden says having the speaker and other stakeholders visit gives them a better sense of the impact of the state investment in venues. A large focus of the investments were in the preparations for the World University Games. So the Olympic Center, the Olympic Oval, uh, Mount Van Hovenberg, the Olympic ski jumps, those received quite a bit of the investment in the capital projects. But in addition to that, we operate three ski mountains, Bel Air, Gore, and Whiteface. Uh, Those also 
uh, were part of the capital project to continue to upgrade so that we can keep up with the evolving climate change and also make sure that we're providing excellent guest experiences and economic impact to the regions we operate. During his visit, Speaker Hasty also announced a $250,000 grant to the Lake Placid Food Pantry and Thrift Shop. I'm Pat Bradley for the New York Public News Network. This is North Country Public Radio. Listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio. It's about 20 after 8. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski. So glad you could join us. Coming up in just a minute, we'll take a look at the new art installation at the Wild Center in Tupper Lake that features the work clothes of farmers throughout the region. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note coming up at 842. We'll take a look at some of the renaming efforts of, uh, of birds, who were many of whom were named after white men who took part in colonizing the Americas or enslaved people. The American Ornithological Society, which governs official bird names in English, is working to rename all birds named after people in North America. We'll have more coming up uh, in just a few minutes at 842 right here on NCPR. But first, we'll take a look at the weather forecast. At last check, it was 62 degrees in the Thousand Islands Park and in Ogdensburg, 66 degrees in Keysville, 64 in Glens Falls right now, and 56 degrees in North Elba. We can expect partly cloudy skies today, a chance of some scattered rain showers this morning, but should be tapering off by the afternoon. Highs in the upper 60s to about 70 degrees today. Overnight tonight, clear skies in the forecast with lows in the upper 40s expected tomorrow mostly sunny skies ahead with highs in the upper 70s to about 80 degrees and as we head into the day on wednesday a chance of rain showers with temperatures again hovering around 80 degrees through the big back windows of the wild center in tupper lake you'll see a 500 foot clothesline with about 150 pieces of clothing on it flapping in the breeze. That's the center's newest summer art installation finished just last Tuesday. The piece by Brenda Baker is called The Clothesline Food, Fiber, Air and Soil. And it's about farming in the North Country and all the unseen labor that goes into producing food. Amy Fireisel stopped by the Wild Center and spoke with Baker just after she finished the installation. So we've just come out of the Wild Center and we're walking in a gravel path um, towards the sort of path that wraps around this pond behind the center. Uh, Can you tell me really quickly what we're looking at? Well, we're looking at a new installation called the Clothesline, Food, Fiber, Air and Soil. And this is a a large-scale sort of site-specific installation and it's made up of clothing donated from about 150 farmers from the Adirondack region. And the, the piece itself is really about um, telling the story, sort of the cultural geography of, of the food and farming uh, movement here in, in the Adirondacks. So each of the pieces of clothing have a tag. Each of the farmers have written a tag uh, that t- tells a little bit about their farming story or, or how they have used this piece of clothing. So the clothing is sort of a, a stand-in for the, sort of the unseen labor in, in the farm industry. And, and really quick, let's go backwards for a second. Can you introduce yourself? Okay. So my name is Brenda Baker. I'm a visual artist from Madison, Wisconsin. And I have, I'm a painter and a sculptor primarily. And I have really, really enjoyed doing temporary site-specific installations as well. And the reason that I, I like the site, site-specific temporary installations is because I, I think art is, is somehow more accessible to, to more people when it's outside of a museum or outside of a gallery setting. So, I, you know, it's a nice way to open up conversations that you might not otherwise have with people. 
you know, that's something that I really enjoy doing. So I've done installations, another clothesline, uh, a really large clothesline in Wisconsin that was about three quarters of a mile long about eight years ago. And that, that was, that sort of spurred this idea. And, and in that situation, I collected about 900 pieces of clothing, but I didn't collect the stories of the farmers. And I really felt like that was a missing piece. So this installation is really about the stories and about the farm community here. So it's, I mean, it's visually, it's really fun and playful visually as well. But I think um, this has a different depth to it. And and so we've just reached one end of it. Mm -hmm. And you've actually separated the clothing by color. And it's quite striking. I mean, Mm -hmm. with all the greenery out, Mm -hmm. um, you can sort of see the bit, you know, the pops of color sort of peeking through the trees and the bushes. I particularly like the, I I like the variety of the things people donated. So people donated socks and gloves and hats and, you know, vests for tapping maple sugar trees and, um, you know, really ratty clothing. So this one has a green tag on it. So this is Adam um, Hayner from Juniper Hill Farm. And the green tags denote that we actually did an interview and we have a short little documentary uh, about Adam and his uh, Juniper Hill Farm. So there are um, nine green tags out here and so that these these are all short little videos and this one the clothing story it's very very to the point my daily work pants yes exactly yeah and you can see that you know they're really holy they've got all sort of splotches of grease and paint and you know all sorts of things on them so they look like they've been well worn some of the other pieces of clothing this is a student from north country school in lake placid um this student wrote this sweater kept me warm throughout the maple sugaring season as i tapped trees and collected sap buckets in the deep snow helping make maple syrup with my eighth grade class made it taste sweeter knowing it was a community effort so what i really love about the stories here is that the collectively with 150 different stories you really get a a snapshot of who's participating in farming and all of the different things that people are excited about. So some people are excited about the community. Some are excited about the fact that they're on a fourth or fifth generation farm and that it's really been a family tradition that they're carrying on. Um, other people talk about um, economics and, you know, how challenging farming is and that they are stitching their clothes again and again and again because, you know, because farming is expensive. I think when you look at all the stories together, it, it tells a really interesting, you know, tale about about farming here. Oh, and here we've, we've actually got a single glove mm-hmm. and then a pair of uh, black rubber boots. Yes, yes. So I, we hadn't anticipated that people would donate boots, but, but several did, so they are incorporated into the clothesline. Now, was it tricky at all to get this clothing? You know, uh, well, were people yes. readily donating it? Um, you, we could ask Lillian about that. So Lillian's been the project manager here from the Wild Center, and and it, it was more challenging than we might have imagined. So Lillian did have to drive around a fair bit. So Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I drove hundreds of miles from Essex to St. Lawrence County through Hamilton County. We had drop-off bins at four different locations, so people could bring clothes to their closest location, drop them off and fill out a tag or I emailed over 100 farms I said can I have your dirty clothes and they said why and I explained it and they said this is awesome so yeah. um, I was really fortunate with the with the um, feedback that I got lots of miles to collect but I had a great great help from a lot of people yeah, yeah. It, it has like it has this real physical impact for me seeing all of the individual pieces of clothing mm-hmm. and knowing that they were owned by all these different people and right. used for these different things and you've been working at this for days now right and actually yes. installing the work and putting up yeah. the pieces I mean, of clothing the first week i was here i mostly was sewing tags and the insides of each of the garments sort of figuring out what the arrangement should be uh and it was i would say you know I didn't really know what the color scheme would be until I got here because I didn't know how much we'd have of each thing. And then I did have to supplement with a few filler pieces um, from Thrifty Nifty, I guess, in town here. So um, There's a lot, lots of blue jeans, as you can see. Lots yeah. of blue jeans, lots of coveralls. Yes, lots of coveralls. Those were, those were hard to sew onto the line. The, um, everything, because this is going to be up in, through November, and then hopefully eventually we'll travel pieces of it, um, everything is sewn on the line as well. So the the clothespins are ceremonial, ceremonial. <laughs> at best, yeah. But but they're but it, it's kept yeah. on by actually being sewed onto yes. the line. I yes. see, I see. Yep. And what do you hope? Um, what do you hope that viewers will take away when they see this installation? 
Well, I hope that they, you know, I have a smile on their face and, and also that they that they get to a little bit of understanding more about what, what is happening here in the Adirondacks in terms of the, the food. They get to know their farmers in the community that they live in or that they're visiting. Uh, so I, I would hope that that's the, the big takeaway. And also I think art is, is sometimes a, a way that, that to have conversations about things that you might not normally talk about. So I've, I mean, just in my time of installing here, I've, I've had so many wonderful conversations with people about, about agriculture, about food, about solar panels, about soil, about you name it, um, politics, what, you know, whatever, whatever they happen to see that sparks